Say hi to your neighbor. This is church. Say hi to your neighbor. Know who your neighbor is. And before I share what the Lord has put in my heart, I want us to appreciate Menester Gedai and Anne. They are back with us at Shaira. Karibuni sana watumishi wa Mungu. Where you are, where we missed you. Did we miss them? Especially the ministry team. Did we miss them? Yes, we missed you. My name is Washua Mwagi. And this morning, I'm so born again. I love the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I am so humbled that I'm the carrier of the message this morning. In absentia, I want to honor Bishop and Mom and all the pastors that are away and the only one that is present this morning. <laughs> She's called my Moroga Mereri Reverend Bibona Sifiwe. We honor God that we serve in this place and every leader, every minister, I want you to know that I honor the graces of God upon your lives. Bona Sifiwe. Thank you, man of God, Pastor Paul. Thank you for the word in the morning. And this morning, I want us to look at a topic I'm calling Living Within the Instructions of God. Living Within the Instructions of God. And Pastor Paul in the morning really did a good job on us. Sometimes we are young people, so we come for the youth service. So if you're in this service, please check it out. I know it will be uploaded tomorrow on our YouTube. Please listen to that message that Pastor Paul shared in the morning. Lately, personally, I've been asking myself a few questions. And the first question I've been trying to ask myself and I have not yet answered it is, do we know who we are as a church? Do we know who we are as individual believers? Why is the church not walking in the authority of God? Why are we so silent? Why isn't our voice being heard anywhere? Why are sinners so comfortable in our midst? Those are the questions that I've been asking myself. If you, when you read the book of Acts, you see the things that our church did. And I've been looking at myself, I've been looking at the church. When I mean the church, I mean believers. One as if you were. I mean believers who have confessed that they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? To us. The Bible says when Christ returned home, the disciples who are unschooled, who are just ordinary men, who are fishermen, they were turning cities upside down. What happened to the church of 21st century? When we went to Nakuru this year for the pastor's conference and spouses, we were told three things. We were told, number one, you need a mentor. It is not in my notes. I hadn't meant to say this. You need a mentor. Number two, you need a coach. And number three, you need a confronter. A coach, a mentor, and a confronter. And this morning, I want to pick where Pastor Paul added in the first service, and I want to be a confronter to every person listening to my voice this morning. What does a confronter do? A confronter confronts you so that you can be able to move to your next level, so that you can stop living the kind of a life you are living. This week, as I was preparing this message, one thing that kept on ringing in my mind is that we are having sinners to hell. We have loved sinners so much that we are having them to hell because we can't antagonize their lives. We can't tell them that they are living 
in a sinful way. We need to start loving sinners to heaven. We need to start telling sinners there is hell and there is heaven. And that Jesus came so that they can be saved and they can go to heaven. We don't want to antagonize them. We want them to be our friends. I don't have a problem with that. But when they will get to hell, they will wonder what kind of a friend you are. It is time we stand up and tell our husbands, if they are not born again, they are living in sin. It is time to tell our wives, if they are not born again, and even if they are born again, if they are not living right, it is time to confront sin. It is time to tell your parents. It is time to tell your brothers and sisters, your colleagues at work. Why? Because time is not on our side. Time is not on our side. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming and he is coming soon and he is coming for a holy church he is coming back and coming back for a holy church when i see figure rest time believers we woke up to the realization we were not born again to enjoy life here. It is part of it. But we were born again and commissioned that we may be able to grab sinners from hell and take them to the everlasting life of salvation. Living well and living right is okay. But your greatest commission is to witness it is to keep on reminding one another that we are temporary here. We are passing by. When we got born again, those old good days, the message that was so much pre preached to us was that we are living here very, very temporary. The highest number of years you can live is 120 years. That's a very short time. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we have a short time to be on earth. And so we need to tell everybody around us that there is hell and there is heaven. You know, we want to tell everybody how God loves them. Yes, he loves them, but he doesn't love their sinful way of living. Can I repeat that? Jesus loves sinners, but he doesn't love their sinful way of living. Amen? Media people, let's go to Judges chapter 16. Let's read together. So she wove it tightly with the pattern of loom and said to him, the Philistines are up, are upon you. We are reading together. Bona si fiwe? It is okay. I have, today I'm not expecting a lot of amens, but let's read the word of God together. So, she wove a tightly with a button of room and said to him, The Philistines are upon you. But he woke up from his sleep and pulled out the button and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times. Please note that. How many times? And have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she had pestered him daily with her words and blessed him so that his soul was vexed to death. That he had told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite from God, from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and like any other man. 
When the writer saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart, so that the lords of the Philistines came up and brought the money in their And brought what? Money in. Then she lured him to sleep in her knees. I love other, the other version that says in on her wraps, on her thighs, and called for a man, and him shaved him off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. I want us to stop from there, and let's read Genesis chapter 26, 1 to 6. Let's do it together. There was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gela. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land for which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I'll be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants, I give all these lads, and I will perform the oath which I saw to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lads, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gera. Amen. Those are going to be our two leading verses, so I'll keep on referring to them. And today, as I said, we are looking at how we are responding to the instructions of God as a church. The two verses we have read, the two texts, that is from Genesis 26 and from Judges 16, talks about two sons of the promise, Isaac and Samson. Isaac and Samson were both children of the promise. For Isaac, God told them, I'm going to give you a son so that you can raise a god seed for me, Abraham. And for Samson, God appeared to the mother. She had not prayed. But God came to Manoah's wife and told her, I am giving you a son because I want to raise for myself a judge. I want to raise for myself a judge. And these are the instructions. Number one, the mother was to keep away from wine and any fermented drink. She was not to eat or touch anything unclean, anything that would defile her. And for Samson, he was not allowed to shave. He was not allowed to touch anything dead. He was also not supposed to be taking wine and fermented drinks. Why? Because God had set him apart as a Nazarite even before he was born. These are two children of the promise. Every one of them have instructions. Isaac, it is, it is famine time, and he wants us to do what the father had done. Because many times, we always want to do the easy thing. The easy thing for Isaac was just to cross over, go to Egypt, because there was abundance. But God spoke to him and told him, stay here. Stay Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, stay under the instructions of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we may do what? Walk in them. God has prepared. The fact that Noejo appeared to your mother. The fact that there was no drama around your birth. It doesn't mean you're not consecrated for God. Because the Bible has clearly told us in Ephesians 2. 
that we are his workmanship created in Christ. For what? For good work. So it doesn't matter how your birth was. One as if you were. One as if you were. You are set apart. You are created for good work in Christ Jesus. Psalms 139, 17 to 17, we are, going not, we are not going to read. It tells us that God planned for us before you were born. In Kirigoris, in Kisumu, in Moranga, wherever. God planned for you and ordained your days. One as if you were. So we see two sons of the promise given instructions. And Isaac wanted just to do the easy way, get out of Gera, get out of Canaan, go down to Egypt because there was abundance. Running away or following the easy route is not always the, easy, the right thing. It does not always give desired results. If you ask Naomi, she will tell you better. She ran because there was famine in the land. But as she ran, because she did not wait on God, she, when she was coming back, she came back empty-hearted. Listening and obeying God's instruction is what is key. God knows our individual assignment. And he also knows our place of assignment. He knows our individual assignment. And he also knows our place of assignment. If Isaac had gone down to Egypt, I'm sure the story would be different today. But because he listened to God, and God told him, Isaac, stay in your place of assignment. And as in the place of our assignment, when we walk in obedience, that God blesses us. And as at the place of our assignment, that God prospers us, friends. So when God says, don't, wait and obey. I am sure it may not be recorded. But Isaac was wondering, God, are you for real? You want me and my people to die in this famine. But if you read that story, the Bible says that he planted in the days of famine and harvested a hundredfold. Why? Because he was within his place of his assignment. Stay at your place of assignment and run to obey God. This may mean in our days staying at the place of our assignment. It could be the hardest thing that we're ever going to do. It may mean that you're going to be out of business. It may mean you're going to fall off with your boss. It may mean you're going to fall off with your very good friends, the people that you thought are going to help you. But I would better fall out, be out of everything, but remain within the will of God. I may, I don't mind falling off from everything that looks glittering as long as I remain within the will of God. It looked very odd for Isaac that he was obeying to stay in famine. When he could look across and see there was a lot of abundance in Egypt. Friends, friends, let us stay within the will and the instructions of God. One as if he were. When God instructs, he knows the way. Because his plan and purpose for us is always good. And it may not have looked good for Isaac, but God knew. I want to glorify, my, glorify myself in this famine. I want to glorify myself if Isaac, you will only obey. And this morning, the Lord is saying the same thing. <coughs> if only you are ready and willing 
to obey his instructions. Your place of assignment may not be looking that good this morning. But if we are going to obey and stay, you can be sure God is going to prosper us. When we read the story of Samson, the Philistines constantly enticed the children of Israel and led them astray into worshipping idols. And so in chapter 16, we see Samson. He has been raised as a judge and the Bible records that he was a judge for 20 years. But in chapter 16, I want to remind you why he was raised. He had been raised so that he can be able to deal with the Philistines. That was his purpose. But even as though he was a judge, and I want to remind you that he was anointed before he was born. So he was carrying such a great grace upon himself. But in chapter 16, we see Samson looking over to Gaza. And in Gaza, he saw the prosperous city. Gaza was a commercial city. So life in Gaza was beautiful. It was glamorous. Life, that is where life was happening in the city of Gaza. And Samson, a whole anointed judge, looked over and he decided to make a visit. Tell your friend, don't try to make a visit to Gaza. And when he landed in Gaza, the Bible says he saw the harlots of Gaza. And he desired them. Remember he had been told, keep yourself off from defilement. But he saw them and he desired them. Then here, next time he visited, go read the whole chapter 16. He saw another beautiful woman and he told the father, I want to marry this one. You know, the father would have refused because he had known the instructions of God. He allowed him. And after some time, he visited a valley called Sorek. And there, there, he met his destroyer. He met the rider. And he loved it. He lasted, he didn't love, he lasted after this woman called Remember the instructions that he had not to associate with himself with any unclean. He had been told, keep off because you need to guard this anointing that I have released over you for a judge. Isn't this what we are doing as the body of Jesus Christ? We have forgotten the grace we carry. You don't have to be a pastor. You just need to carry the blood of the lamb upon your life. You need to remember as you walk, as you walk, that you carry a mark of salvation. You need to remember you cannot defile yourself. You need to remember there are people you cannot associate yourself with. Because if we are not careful, we'll be sleeping on some thighs somewhere. And that there rise our destruction. He loved Derida. And he enticed her one time, two times, three times. And he all she wanted, because she did not love him. All she wanted was to understand this strength that carries gates. Remember, if you read chapter 13 all the way to 16, you remember the first time that Samson went there, they wanted to get hold of him. He moved with the gates, not doors, gates. Adisifanya hivi akavunja vunja, akazimbeba. So Deraira was so mesmerized by this man. And all he, which he wanted to know was where is this power coming from? The church has very clear instructions on the boundaries that we need to keep. 
but Gaza has kept enticing us. It looks pleasurable out there. The life in Gaza, the life in the world, friends, is very promising. Gaza doesn't mind our anointing. It is okay to tell people you're born again as long as you will do what they want you to do. It is okay to tell your boss how born again you are as long as when he will want to sleep with you, you will be sleeping with them. They don't mind. They actually don't mind your testimony. They don't mind your testimony as long as they will give you some money so that you can pass their payments. Gaza doesn't mind our anointing. They knew Samson was raised as a judge. He had ruled them for 20 years. He had fought them. He had fought them and fought them well. But because of Gaza, he forgot the anointing of God upon his life and he compromised. Friends, the reason we are not moving in authority, the reason why we have lost our voice it is because we have compromised. We just live a life like any other ordinary Kenyan. A time has to come where we have to make a decision that I carry an anointing that I'm ready to sacrifice for. I carry an anointing that I need to guard. I carry a savior that I need to make him look good. Oh, my Lord, this morning. We need to know who we are. We need to remember we are sojourners. We cannot get comfortable in Gaza. If Samson had remembered that he had been raised for a specific assignment, he would not have lied on the thighs of Deraira because that was defilement. And church, aren't we lying on many, many, many defiled thighs? And no wonder. We have no voice. We have no manifestation of the glory of God. When we gather together as an assembly of believers and God speaks to us, it becomes news. It is supposed to be the norm. Every time we gather as an assembly, God ought to give a voice. But when he speaks, it is news and we celebrate. I pray that we can walk right before God. That we can walk in holiness. We can obey the instructions of God, however hard they may be looking. We need to walk right before the cartels that we are working with. You are in a cartel. You are working for the government. But you are in the cartel. Will you have a voice to tell them that there is a heaven that we are going? I want to remind you, friends, God's presence does not override our will. Samson was anointed, and God knew, this is my judge. I have lifted him for such a time. But God does not override our will. He does not put a bridle here that he can be able to pull us around no, 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 no. He allows us to make choices. He allows you to decide what to do with your salvation. He allows us the opportunity to choose him of our pleasures. He gives us an opportunity to choose salvation of our money. He gives us an opportunity to choose him of a sin, that is our God. He allows us space. So it is upon us. We are anointed and he knows it, but he does not override over our will. Staying at the place of your appointed assignment is more important than status, than fame.
If Samson had remembered over and over that I am the one who is supposed to be judging these uncircumcised Philistines, if he had kept on reminding himself who he was and why he was raised by God, we would not be reading chapter 16 of Judges. Your blessing can only trace you at the place of your divine assignment. And as I said, Isaac is a good example. Samson could not control his lust towards this woman of Gaza called Deraira. This impaired his thinking and his choices. It impaired how he was thinking. At the point where he is lying on the thighs of Deraira, do you think he was thinking, I'm the judge of Israel? Do you think he was thinking, I'm the judge of Israel? I want you to see a president lying on the thighs of some woman somewhere. Do you think at that point he's thinking how powerful he is because he's the president? He's just thinking how he's going to have sex with that woman. We need to keep on reminding ourselves who we are, what our assignment is, what instructions we received from the Father. He allowed emotions to control him over logic. If at that point when he was lying there, he remembered Samson, the reason you are raised is so that you can deal with the Philistines. And you cannot be able to tell Deraira where your strength comes from because that is your secret weapon. This was his secret weapon towards the Philistines. We have allowed the enemy in our Amaris church. We have allowed the enemy to get into our, our armory. And no wonder we are walking so weak as a church. No wonder we are walking so weak as individuals. Because the moment Deraira discovered that was the head of Samson church. We cannot keep on allowing the enemy in our armory. We have to cross the doors where our sacred weapons rise so that we can continue walking in victory. Three times, the rider had tried to understand where the strength of Samson was coming from. Three times God gave him an opportunity to run. Three times God gave him an opportunity to remember who he was. Three times. But he was so rusted over this woman. The Bible says in Genesis 4, 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin crouches at your door. And it desires for you. But you must master it, church. We need to master sin. We need to master sin because if we do not, it is going to destroy us. We must. Three times God gave Samson an opportunity to master sin. Three times. But he couldn't. It destroyed him. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Free from the desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Proverbs 6, 25. Do not trust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. Church. 
There are some sins that you don't contend with. There are some sin that you just need to run. There are some sins you don't start there to think how anointed you are. You can be able to contend with no friends. Some sins you need to run and run and run and not turn back. Joseph is a good example. Samson had three opportunities to run from Deraira, but she did not. She stayed, he stayed there and eventually he lost his armory. We will say it was just an innocent kiss. I was just watching something and this pornographic site popped up. He just called me and I went to his house. She just called me. You know, the boss promised me one, two, three, four. I didn't mean to give that bribe, but I needed money for school fees. Friends, some sin you don't contend. You learn and learn with your two feet. I want to remind us this morning that deception is real and very attractive. God knew that the women from Gaza were very beautiful. And if Samson was not careful, he would have fallen in their hearts. When God draws boundaries for us, friends, it is not for him to benefit. It is for our safety. So when God tells, don't cross, don't cross. Obey. When God was raising Samson, he knew, I am throwing you in the land of Philistine and the women there can be very beautiful. They are very deceptive. And that's what he, what he had been told. Don't touch. Boundaries are for our safety. God does not benefit by us keeping our boundaries. The boundaries he has laid out for us. It is for our own safety. Judges chapter 16 verse 19 says, And after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven blades of his hair. And so he began to subdue him, and his strength left. The disobedience of one person church affects the whole assembly. So wherever you are on a Wednesday, wherever you are on a Friday, please remember, you belong to an assembly of believers. Your disobedience affects the entire body of Jesus Christ. Not only here, wherever believers are. So by some son not obeying the instructions of God, the entire community of Israel was affected. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, chapter 12, 14, 15, I read, the Lord replied to Moses, if her father had spit on her face, would she not have been disgraced for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days. And the people did not move on till she was brought back. This is the story of Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. When she, was, she became leprous, she was kicked outside of the camp for seven days. The children of Israel could not move. Because of the sin of one lady called Miriam. Friends, when we are walking in disobedience to the instructions of God, you are not just affecting yourself, but you are affecting the whole body of Jesus Christ. When I mean the body of Jesus Christ, I don't mean this assembly gathered here. I mean every believer, whether you know them or you do not know them. So it is time to do an audit of your own life. 
Bwana asifiwe. When we live outside of the instructions of God, the enemy makes part of us by bridling us. If you read the entire chapter 16, you realize they went step by step. They cut the hair. And after that, And after they had cut the hair, they gouged out his eyes. When we have allowed the enemy into the armory, what he does, and it is the most sad thing, he takes away our vision. He takes away our vision. And so when we become visionless, the enemy can take us anywhere he desires. A whole mighty man of God, anointed and raised for his generation, became the entertainer of his enemies. He started grinding for his enemies. They would call people in the temple of Dagon. And they are in Samson, the anointed one, would be entertaining them. Why? Because his vision was taken away. When our vision as a church, friends, is taken away, the enemy will cause us to dance to their tunes. They will cause us to become anything they want us to do. We will sing their songs. We will dance their tunes. It pains me every time I'm passing through a bar. And I see a gospel musician. Posters written there. So and so is coming this Friday here. And the entry is one beer. Where is our testimony as a church? And that same gospel musician, we will invite them here. And they will come to entertain us. The same, same gospel musician could be a worship leader in a certain church. Because we have allowed the enemy in our family. He has taken away our vision as a church and as individuals. And then he can be able to do anything. He will make sport for us. We will grind for them so that they can feed us. Isn't that what is happening in the church in Kenya? That we are grinding for them so that they can feed us. So that they can give us money to build churches. So that they can give us money to do projects for the church. Who told us our God is a poor God? We don't need to grind for anybody to do anything for us. God is an all-sufficient God. He can just raise one person to do a project for the church. We don't need. We don't need to grind for the Philistines so that we can live right as a church. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. We have to guard our assignment, church. We have allowed entertainers on our pulpits. We have allowed motivational speakers to be the people coming to preach to us. Our messages ought to be transformative messages. Praise be to God. We have to guard our assignment as a church and as individuals. The Bible says in the book of Romans eleven twenty nine, as I bring this to a close, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them when once they are given and he does not change his mind about those whom he gives his grace or to whom he sets his call. That is the saddest bit. Because some of you are wondering, 
God would have stopped Samson from doing what he was doing. No. When God has anointed you, he has anointed you. It is irrevocable. So you will go sleeping around with every skirt wearer when you are still anointed as a minister. You will sleep with everybody around when you are still anointed as an usher. You will do anything you want to do when you still carry the anointing. What a disgrace to God. What a disgrace to God. The other time I stood here, I said, we are praying around with the grace of God. Because we have, the enemy has given us this deception. We can do anything as long as, as, long as we will come back and repent. Three chances and God allowed Samson to be destroyed. God may be giving you one, two, three. But a time comes when God says, enough is. One of the books I'm reading right now is the book written by Ladville. It is called Why Revival Tarries. And he says that this generation that we are living in is drinking wickedness like water. Isn't this generation that has shown us every wickedness and they are not apologetic? It is this generation that we are living in. We have seen anything and everything that we can call wickedness. We have allowed everything, even in church, and we are comfortable. I came to remind us this morning, God is not looking for a glamorous church, but God is looking for a church that is holy and submitted to his instructions. God is looking for a church that is holy and submitted to his instructions. Buana Yesu as if he were. He's not impressed by how we live, by the way. God is not impressed by your big car. Big cars are good. I love machines. And those who know me, they know me. They are because I love speed, so I love machines. So it is okay. God is not impressed by your area of living. He's not impressed that you live in Karen, Modaiga, name it. He's not impressed. I want to remind you that he owns the world. Actually, it is his resting. This is where he keeps his feet to rest. This world that we think is so, so precious that we are exchanging it for holiness. I want to remind you. So we cannot ever impress God. We can never. Hallelujah. As I conclude this, media give me verse 28 of Judges 16. Judges 16 verse 28. As they look for it. All right, let's read. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh Lord God, please remember me. Hallelujah. Keep it there, media. This is one of the most desperate prayers that have ever been done in the Bible. Samson woke up to the realization that I have crossed every boundary I was told not to cross. I have done everything a Nazarite ought not to do. He woke up to the realization I have allowed the enemy 
to do whatever it is that he wants to do with me. He woke up to the realization of the shame he was suffering as an, as an entertainer to his enemies. He woke up to the realization that I was anointed <coughs> sorry, as a judge so that I can defend my people. But here I am. I am grinding for the same people I was supposed to be defending my people from so that they can feed me. <laughs> he woke up to the realization that I have crossed all these boundaries. But he arose and realized like the political son, I have a merciful God. I have a God who forgives. I have a God whose anger lasts only for a moment. But his mercy endures forever. Friends, I want to tell you, when we have disobeyed God, I still want to remind you that he's a merciful God. There is a cry that breaks heaven. There is a cry that touches the heart of God. And this was the cry that Samson cried that night. And he told God, remember me. This one more time, God. This one more time. Give me victory over my enemies. And today, friends, I came to tell you there is a desperate turn around cry that touches God and he remembers. But when you have done this cry, then you have to remain under the instructions of the almighty God. We have to turn around God has no problem with sinners coming to church. But God has a problem with sinners being comfortable in our midst. I repeat again. God has no problem with sinners in our midst. But the problem is that they are becoming too comfortable in our midst. Where is the problem? Is it that God stopped moving? Is it that God stopped manifesting himself? No, we defiled ourselves. And God is not going to move through defiled vessels. But there is a cry that we can do today. And that cry is found in Psalms 139, 23 and 24. And this is David crying out to God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any wickedness or heart of way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. That's our Father. That's our God. And I pray that the church in this dispensation we can wake up to the realization that we have an assignment. We can wake up to the realization it doesn't matter how anointed you are. God does not override that. We can wake up to the realization that we serve a merciful God. But God is not going to work with a defiled church. We need to wake up to the realization that God has given us the opportunity to house the Holy Spirit in our very own bodies. God has given us an opportunity to be his ambassadors here on earth. Will we rise up to that occasion and serve God under his instructions, not at our own instructions. Because when we want to serve God at our own instructions, that is when we become like Samson. The singer of the song that we love singing, the song I have decided to follow Jesus. I want all of you to go read about that story. 
is I was an Indian man. And when he accepted Christ, he was told to deny him or everything about him will be taken away. And not just being taken away, that his family will be killed. And he said, I'm not going to deny Jesus. And he kept on confessing that song is a confession. He was not singing. He was just confessing what he was hearing in his spirit. And when his wife and children were killed, he was told, deny Christ now. He sang the last stanza. What does it say? The cross. Before me and the world behind. And he walked to his execution. Church, have we put the cross or the world before us? That is the question I want to leave you with. What are you seeing as you look ahead? Are you seeing the cross or are you seeing the world? There is a cry we can cry today and I want us to stand up. And for the next one minute, I want us to cry that cry of Samson. Lord, remember me. Give me victory over my enemies. This one more time. This one more time, Lord, remember us. We can cry out to God that he may restore our sight. That we may remember the assignment that he has given each one of us. David, we can cry out, search me. Fight if there is any wickedness in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Oh, shakara baba zayante. Rekashe rebebe kayanda rorobo siti ribianda rorobo shayu. For the everlasting king, we know you are a merciful, loving, and a kind God. But Lord, you are so desiring our oh, church, individuals, Lord, who are holy and submitted to your instructions, God. I pray that those instructions may be heard, Lord, that you be ready and willing to obey them. Like Isaac of old, Lord, he obeyed. Though it looked out of place, Lord, but out of those instructions, God, you blessed him. Father, I pray that every one of us who have run like Samson and gone to Gaza, that God, you would forgive us this morning. Oh, that God, we will not entertain our enemies. That God, our vision will not be taken away. Oh. Lord, without a vision, we are dead. I pray for the church in Kenya this morning. That God, we can know who we are. We can have a vision. Of the cross of Jesus. That as a church in this nation, we can know who we are. We can walk under your own instructions, O oh God of glory, so that our voice can be restored. That when we speak, we can speak with the authority of your holiness, God. Remember every individual person in this sanctuary today. That God, we will be submitted to your instructions, our Father. That we can walk under your direction, Lord. That we can remember the grace and the anointing you have released upon us, God. And we can guard it generously, our Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. God, we know that your gifts are irrevocable. God, I pray for every believer. 
Oh, that God you will, Holy Spirit, you will remind us every day that we carry you. That God we carry you. Shekaralaba setarebosayo. And that God, we will not have seen us to hell. That we will love them so much. We will antagonize their lives by the message of salvation. And God, I pray for Shira Worship Center. That God, you will sanctify us. You will sanctify us and cover us with your glory. That every time an unbeliever walks in this sanctuary, God, they will be so uncomfortable with your glory that they will surrender their lives to you, our Father. We honor you, Lord, and we give you all the praise. Receive honor, Lord, and receive glory in Jesus' name.